Well, hello there, Stacy Murphy here of Grow Your Own Vegetables, and this video is 10 tricks to growing delicious organic tomatoes in your garden right at home and lots of them. All right, so I'm gonna be sharing in this video my top 10 hacks for how you can get more homegrown tomatoes on your plate with less work. And what the heck is a hack? Well, that's exactly what it is. It's a tool, a gadget, uh, it's a mindset shift or a strategy that essentially helps you simplify a process. So in this case, it's all about getting more homegrown tomatoes on your plate with less work. Now, you may be growing your tomatoes indoors or outdoors, in containers or in soil. You're gonna find tips here that are gonna work for you. And if you're just getting started growing tomatoes, these tips are gonna be awesome because it's gonna help you get off on the right foot. And if you're a more seasoned grower and you've been growing tomatoes for a couple of years, you're gonna hear a couple of things that you've never heard before and it's gonna help you improve your yield, both flavor and the amount of tomatoes that you're gonna get. So before we get started, remember I mentioned there are four different types of hacks. There are gadgets that you can simply go out and buy at the store that can make your job easier. There are do-it-yourself solutions where you can replicate those tools. There are strategies that you can come up with in order to try to simplify your gardening. There's also mindset shifts that can just simply shift the way you're thinking about things and make everything easier. So as you're listening to these hacks, my intention is that these are the my top 10 hacks for growing more or delicious tomatoes in your garden. Keep in mind though, if you are thinking about it in this framework of tools, do it yourself, strategy and mindset hacks, that you're gonna come up with new solutions to whatever your challenges are in your garden as well. All right, so let's get started. Here's tomato hack number one. So let's start with a mindset hack, all right? I want easy wins in the garden, and I assume that you do too. I want to work with nature to grow a lot of fresh tomatoes. It sounds easy enough, right? So before we go any further, there is one very important thing that you need to know. We're talking about growing tomatoes here, and growing tomatoes is not the easiest plant to grow in the garden. So if you're a beginner who's just getting started, this is the most important thing you can hear right now because it's going to change your mindset when you're growing your tomatoes. And if you're an, a more seasoned grower, then this is a great reminder for you as well, all right? So there are 56 known diseases that can affect your tomato plants. That's a lot of diseases. And this can happen where it can take out your plants pretty quickly, all right? And there are also seven uh, pests that can also take out your plants pretty quickly. That's a lot that can go wrong. Whereas basil, it has four known diseases that can affect it. Big difference. So basically your tomato plants are 14 times more likely to get sick than your basil plants. So keep in mind as a mindset that you are growing something that is a little bit more challenging. So that alone will help you be more patient and also will help you uh, when things go wrong that you don't beat yourself up for it, okay? Now, tomatoes are one of the most beloved plants on the planet, right? Think of every cuisine. Normally, it has some sort of tomato in the cultural traditions, right? So just because your tomato plants are 17 times more likely to catch a disease than a basil plant, it doesn't mean that they're not worth growing, all right? So, and here's the good news, is that even the people who are getting diseases with their tomato plants, which, by the way, is most gardeners I know, their tomato plants are catching diseases at some point during the growing season. Even when that happens, you can still get some tomatoes. So that's the good news. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to share some tips and some tricks to get us ahead of those diseases and help to avoid those diseases so that you can enjoy more homegrown tomatoes on your plate, all right? So shift the mindset. Tomatoes are not the easiest plant in the world to grow, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't grow them. But what it does mean is that we should be patient with ourselves as we're learning to grow tomatoes, and also not freak out when something goes wrong, because you know what? Something probably will. So it's just about knowing what to do, adapting and reacting quickly when something does happen to your tomatoes. And during this presentation, I'm gonna show you some of those things that you can do to improve your harvest. Tomato hack number two. All right, so building off of that mindset that we want easy wins in the garden, that we want to work with nature so that we can get more homegrown food on our table more simply, here is a strategy hack that helps you uh, accomplish that with tomatoes. 
choose varieties that are well adapted to your local conditions so that they're easy to grow. And so in your local big box stores or your nurseries, they're not selling necessarily the best tomatoes for your local conditions. They're selling the tomatoes that are adapted for many different climactic conditions that are people's favorites. Things like Better Boy or things like um, an heirloom like a Brandywine tomato or things like Early Girls, Sun Gold Cherry Tomatoes. These are things that work in a lot of different locations and so a lot of big box stores and a lot of nurseries have them on, on hand. But they might not be the best variety for your local conditions. They may work okay but they may not be the best variety so there might be something easier for you which is uh, specific to where you live. So now, how do you do this, right? So here's an example. I recently moved to San Diego, started growing here. So what's the first thing I did? I started asking around the local gardeners to find out what their local favorites were. And then I also thought about, from my experience growing, what some of my favorites were that I thought might be adapted to these specific conditions. So here we have a pretty hot climate during the summer. It gets pretty hot, it gets pretty dry. We got well draining soil, I got the ocean. So I, in my, I, I looked back at my experience and I thought of some tomatoes that I thought might work. Now you might not have that experience and so what I've done is I've created a cheat sheet for you that goes along with this video that talks about different varieties and what kind of conditions they're good for. So check that out. Alright, so what happened here in San Diego? So what I did is I grew my first year here. Two of my favorites are Sun Golds because they are uh, delicious and they're fast and they're plentiful and green zebras for many of the same reasons and I thought they would do well here and then I also grew Rapunzel which the locals loved and I also grew San Francisco Fog which a lot of people told me was great for growing right on the ocean and I tried all four of those the first season and guess what I found out so interestingly enough the Sun Golds didn't do so well here but the green zebras did great, so I'm growing them again this year. Now, the Rapunzel's that the locals liked, those worked great as well. But guess what? The San Francisco fog didn't work out so well. So even if there is a local favorite, your specific soil conditions might be a little bit different. So you want to experiment the first couple years and try out a couple of the local favorites to see what's the easiest to grow. And guess what? Later, just don't grow the things that weren't easy to grow. So what happened here is that the San Francisco fog were actually they they were very susceptible to a fungal spot disease which was happening here and so they basically succumbed to that disease really quickly whereas some of the other tomatoes didn't so now I simply don't grow them all right so you have to be open to doing a little bit of testing in your first couple years and I'm going to share with you in another tip exactly how I go about that testing for now grab that cheat sheet uh, for this video where I show the different varieties and what kind of conditions they're good in because that's going to help short circuit some of your thinking because guess what uh, our typical varieties things like Brandywine things like early girl, better boy. These are things that thrive at a very specific temperature range and basically below 50 degrees Fahrenheit and above 85 or 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, the pollen is not viable, which means that those tomatoes are not going to fruit very well. They're going to have pollination problems, which means you're not going to see as many tomatoes outside of that temperature range. So what you want to do is find tomatoes that actually grow and fruit outside of those temperature ranges. So there are actually Siberian varieties that will flower and fruit all the way down to freezing temperatures, which is great news for those of you with colder climates, northern climates, shorter seasons. And there's also varieties that were cultivated and, and some heirlooms, some hybrids that basically were that, that were grown in Central America and they're really good in hot climates and sometimes in hot and humid and sometimes in hot and dry climates. So there's lots of different varieties and if you try one and it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that you're bad at growing tomatoes. It means that that particular variety might not be the variety for you and where you are locally. All right. So the strategy hack here is if you want simple tomatoes, you want to find varieties that are adapted to your local conditions. You want easy wins. You want less work, which brings more enjoyment in the garden. So the difference this hack can make, when I was growing the San Francisco Fog 
uh, tomatoes here last year and when I was growing the sun gold tomatoes here last year what happened was that I was out here pruning a lot pruning away the disease that was happening on those plants and guess what those plants didn't yield a whole lot of fruit so basically I spent a whole lot of time and effort growing them I didn't get a whole lot of return for them but the other plants they were super easy to grow I didn't have to do a whole lot and I got the tomatoes I wanted so as a strategy working simply and working with nature can in can help you enjoy your garden a whole lot more as well as enjoy more homegrown food on your table. Now here's a pro tip for those of you who are growing tomatoes in containers, all right? The container, uh, because of the size, this is as far as the root systems can grow. So I would recommend picking varieties that are determinate varieties, that are smaller bush determinate varieties, and there's even varieties that are specific for t for containers and they are dwarf varieties things like patio here's tomato hack number three all right so here is the mindset hack that I hope that you adopt for all of your vegetable garden not just your tomatoes and here it is it's super simple what do your plants really want that's how simple it is that question and like us Plants, they want to grow. They want to be healthy and they want to grow. We just need to give them the right habitat for that to happen. And that is our role as a steward and as a partner in that plant's life. So it's as simple as that. What do the plants really want? And so in the heart of that question, think about um, essentially the root system is where it all starts. All right. So basic, basic plant biology. I'm not going to go into major detail here, but there are five stages of growth. And for our tomatoes, we are particularly interested in the fruiting stage of growth because that's where our tomatoes are grown. But it starts with a seed emerging, then it moves into vegetative growth. We want that to be very strong and vigorous. And then we want strong and vigorous fruiting as well. And then from there, the plant goes into its dying phase, which we won't talk about here because that's not what we want for our tomatoes. We want them to be thriving and producing a lot of fruit. All right, so no matter if you're growing in a container or outside in the soil, what a plant wants in those three stages of seed emergence, vegetative growth, and then into the fruiting and flowering, it wants a ecosystem where the roots are going to get everything they need, the moisture they need, the nutrients they need. And so basically for a lot of us, that means the growing medium or the soil is the first thing, the mindset around a super healthy, vibrant ecosystem for, the, that, for those root systems, all right? So in, for tomatoes, you can do a couple of things, all right? This is pretty cool. When you grow tomatoes in raised garden beds and soil, the thing to focus on is feeding that soil. And you want to think slow release nutrients over the course of the entire season. And that's because there is microbiology underground that is feeding those precious nutrients to your plants. So the more you can feed the soil, the more that soil can feed your plants. All right, so here is a great recipe for your raised garden beds and soil. You want a minimum of two inches of good quality compost across all your garden beds each season. And you want to double that if you're growing year round because tomatoes can be some heavy feeders. And then on top of that, when you're growing your tomatoes, when you plant your seeds and if you're growing them in trays you want to add 10% worm poop yes I said worm poop to your growing medium to grow healthy seedlings because uh, Worm poop is shown to have beneficial bacteria that essentially helps ensure that your plants stay healthy and disease-free for the life of that plant. And you can also, when you go to transplant those baby seedlings into your garden, add another trowel full of worm poop for a little bit of a boost. And then finally, the third ingredient to really strong, vibrant um, soil is having minerals and nutrients that your microbiology can feed to your plants. And some of the things tomatoes are going to need, phosphate, calcium, and trace minerals, you can get that with glacial or basalt rock dust. And you can also bury fish bones if you happen to be a fish eater, and that will help benefit your tomatoes as well. And here's a list of a bunch of other ways that people fertilize their tomatoes over the course of a growing season that you might find helpful as well. So here's the deal with growing tomatoes in containers. We've been talking about what do these plants really want? Well, what they want is a thriving ecosystem in here. They want lots of microorganisms and they want lots of nutrients being fed to the plants, but here's all they got. 
everything in this bucket, that's all they got. Whereas when you grow tomatoes in the soil, the tomato root systems can grow out and they can talk to other root systems and they can spread out and they can grab nutrients from a much wider area. But in this bucket, this is all they have. So that means that when we're growing tomatoes in buckets, we want to do a couple things. We want to, over the season, deliver more nutrients to the plant because in the soil we can do it once a season and it's like a slow release formula and basically over the course of the season the plants get those nutrients. But here what can happen is that the nutrients can wash right through the soil and then we end up with no nutrients in here and no biology in here. So what we want to do with containers is pay extra attention to them. They're actually a little bit more challenging to grow in, to, in containers than in soil. So just know that ahead of time. So what I would recommend is a feeding cycle for your tomatoes that are in containers. And the feeding cycle I would recommend is that from when the time you plant it to the time it's about this high, I would be feeding it every two weeks with a solution of a seaweed liquid fertilizer and, and water. And there, when you buy those products, it'll tell you how much to mix with water. Now you can also, if you're somebody who uses animal products, you can use a fish fertilizer, uh, which has some extra nutrients in it, and you can water a liquid fertilizer with that every two weeks. I would also recommend, because that's nutrients, but what about the biology? So I would also recommend if you have some compost to make some compost tea and spray that on the leaves and also water the soil with the compost tea and that'll be like a boost of microbial activity to bring to your plants to really keep them thriving. All right, so that's until they're this high. Then what I would do is, so notice I have fruit starting to form over here. So now the plant is starting to change hormonally and it needs something a little different. So now what I would say is uh, what you wanna add is some sort of fertilizer. Um, this is one that has animal products in it. And what I look for when I look for a bag of fertilizer at the store, I look for a CDFA label or an OMRI label. These are good labels to look for that just show that pe this has been re reviewed in terms of organic matter and approved by those organizations. Um, so this has some animal products in it, things like bone meal, which is, has a lot of phosphorus in it, which is really good for fruiting of tomatoes. So basically, it'll It'll tell you on here how much to add and you want to water it in really well and it'll tell you when to add it now is a good time and typically I do it once at fruit set and then I go back to, to feeding it more uh, liquid seaweed or liquid fish fertilizer and then every other week with some compost teas so that's essentially what I do with my buckets and that ends up yielding some pretty great tomatoes, but I'm also growing smaller varieties in my buckets. So if I were growing varieties that had big tomatoes, I might end up needing more fertilizer because all it's got is this bucket. So you've got to get, it's not like the soil where it can find nutrients and microorganisms elsewhere. Its roots aren't spread out. It's just in this little bucket. So you've got to give it what it wants and you've got to give it exactly where it wants. Otherwise, what you'll end up with are small container tomatoes. And that's what you see from a lot of people. And it's mostly because there's just not enough fertilizer. So the strategy hack here is give the plant what it wants, when it wants it, because that is what's going to lead to tomatoes out of this plant versus it just growing spindly with just a couple of tomatoes. Here is tomato hack number four. Here is another mindset shift that I hope that you adopt for your entire vegetable garden, not just your tomatoes, all right? But I'm gonna make it specific for tomatoes here. So the mindset shift here is that no matter how awesome your soil is, no matter how awesome your growing medium is, you're going to have some plants that fail. And that's just a fact of nature that some plants just won't thrive. So I want you to accept failure all right? I want you to accept that that is going to happen. And it doesn't mean that you have failed. It means that there are some plants that just aren't going to make it. So what I want you to do is to protect yourself from failure so you can turn those failures into success. So here's how you do it for tomatoes. A lot of people, when they talk about tomatoes, they'll tell you to plant your tomatoes 18 inches apart or 12 inches apart or 24 inches apart. Here's what I would recommend. I would recommend that when you have healthy seedlings that are like yay big, six inches tall or taller even, and you're ready to plant them out in your garden, 
I think you should have double the number that you actually want to put in the ground. And what I would do with them is I would plant them every six inches and some of them are going to make it and be thriving and others are not. And so now you have an option to pull plants out which is so much easier than having a failure and pulling it out and having nothing there. So what I like to do is I plant my tomatoes either 12 inches apart or 18 inches apart, depending on what type of variety it is and what type of yield I'm looking for. But if I plant every six inches, now I can pick the plants that are doing the best and I can leave those in the ground and I'm going to pull out the ones that aren't doing as well. All right, so basically you double down and it may cost a little bit more money up front to put a couple extra plants in the ground, but in the long run, now you have short circuited the pro process where if a plant fails, now you've got to go find one and it might not be as old as your other plants. It might not be as well established. So basically what you're doing is you're ensuring that your plants are well established and thriving. Now, I know this mindset shift is funny for people because a lot of times when we think about our garden, we're thinking about what we're planting and what we're growing. As a grower, my most important job is the editing process, the removal process, removing what's not working to make space for what is working. So in order to do that, what I need to do is plant extra of everything and remove what's not working. This is especially true if you have a small garden because you wanna make sure you're taking advantage of every last nook and cranny. If I had a giant yard and a giant farm, I would plant everything far apart and if something failed, I'd just pull it out. But if I have a small space, you better believe I want to take advantage of every little space and so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to double down when I plant and remove anything that's not working turning my failures into successes and one last note about this it also helps if you can have a couple of transplants handy because let's say you have a couple of failures all in a row now you have another plant that you can put in the ground in the place and I had that happen to me this year so you know, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how good your soil it is, there are times when you might see some failures in the field. Uh, it might just be a plant that came from the nursery that wasn't as strong. It might be a series of plants that weren't as strong and you need to pull them out and put something else in. So I always keep an extra around just for that purpose. Are you ready for tomato hack number five? All right, this hack is a triple duty hack. It has three big benefits. The first big benefit is that you will have healthier plants, which are thriving, which is very important. The second part of the hack is that you are going to essentially create more space to grow more food, which means that you get more homegrown harvest, so that's a big benefit. And the third part of the hack is that it makes it easier to water. And when you make things easier to water, it is always more enjoyable in the garden. All right, so triple duty hack here. Basically, you may have heard about this, basically going vertical with your tomatoes. And it doesn't matter if you have a determinant variety or an indeterminate variety of tomatoes, I would still recommend going vertical. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper than that too here. So here's how it works. When you go vertical with your tomatoes, what you're doing is you're getting them up off the soil. And what that does is it ensures that any soil-borne or waterborne diseases that are near the soil don't splash onto your plants. It means healthier plants, more thriving plants, all right? So getting them up off the ground is a really great thing. And pruning away the lower leaves in order to ensure that the plant is really healthy. I like to do that. Okay, so getting it up off the ground, whether it's indeterminate or determinate. Now, what the heck does that mean? So a determinate variety of a tomato is a bushier variety. It has a set amount of growth. It only gets so big and so basically your yield is limited. So you don't want to prune them very much because you're basically you could prune away harvest but with an indeterminate variety it can grow infinitely and basically you see vines that are growing infinitely long when you go to places like Disneyland and you'll see vining tomatoes that seem to last forever and they make big Mickey Mouse uh, ears. So indeterminate are infinite vining options. So you want to get them up off the ground so that they're not laying on the soil where they can end up getting some uh, fungal diseases from the soil. All right, so be very important to get things up off the ground. Now, I recommend a very specific style of 
getting them up off the ground so that you can make your watering all the more easy and also this is an easy way to trellis all right so the style that you see here behind me is a florida weave and the reason it's called a florida weave it started in florida and basically what it is it's, it's a weave there are upright posts and i have bamboo posts for each one of the tomato plants and then basically the twine is woven back and forth around that bamboo and as the tomatoes grow i thread them up through that weave so that they stay upright. Now, it's also helpful in a Florida weave every once in a while where there is a offshoot where there is heavy fruit just below that, that branch with the heavy fruit to tie that back to the bamboo stake. That can really help hold the plant up and make it strong. So that's the basics of the Florida weave. And the idea is to stay ahead of the game. So basically with a Florida weave, you want to, this is in my opinion, one of the most important parts of the Florida weave, stay ahead of the plant. Cause if you have to always weave the plant into the, the twine, you might break the plant. But if you stay ahead of the plant and now when the plant starts to grow, you can just sort of gently nudge it up between the weaves. All right, so that's the most important part of the Florida weave is to stay ahead of the plant, all right? Now, the other reason why I choose the Florida weave is that it's very economical. So one of the things you can do is you can buy cages for your tomatoes. If you only have a couple tomato plants, a Florida weave might be too much for you. So you might want to start simple. Something like this here, where it's basically just an upright uh, and your tomato grows vertically and this is stackable and so basically what you can do is if you just buy a couple of these um, you can have them every year and just reuse them every year so what i do is i just have my uprights on every one of my beds and so as i rotate my tomatoes through each bed i can florida weave the next bed over every year so for me it's really economical i just buy a little bit more string and i do this uh, but if you only have a couple plants it might be more economical to just go and buy a single cage but anything you can do to keep your plant vertical all right now the, the, the really cool part about this is that now that everything is up off the ground, now you can grow underneath it. There's a lot of sunshine that's coming underneath the plant. And especially because as I do the Florida weave, I'm pruning away some of the lower branches. So what, what I like to do is I like to orient my Florida weave north-south. So what that does is the sunlight comes up in the east and, and the sunlight comes down this way and I've basically pruned off the lower layers of branches down here so the sunlight penetrates the soil and I can grow anything underneath the tomatoes. The, so, the sun goes overhead and everything is in this one single line. So now when the sun gets over to here and comes to this, si this side, Again, the branches are pruned, so now the soil underneath always receives sunlight. So I can grow basil underneath, I can grow parsley underneath, I can grow whatever I want underneath. So one of the things I love about this very vertical tomato trellis, in this case it is a Florida weave, so it's woven so that the, it becomes very narrow. It's like a vertical plane of tomatoes down the center of my bed. What that means is that the soil is all open and available for sunlight so that I can grow basil and parsley and pepper plants and other herb plants. That means I can grow more food underneath the tomatoes and everything is getting sunlight. So that's awesome, right? But here's the coolest part. It's so easy to water. I mentioned that when you uh, your tomato plants are very susceptible to waterborne diseases and here in San Diego very susceptible to fungal diseases when they get wet and so now I don't even have to get the tomato plants wet at all I can just water the soil because they're in one single vertical plane so all I got to do is water this side and then when I'm done watering that side I come over on this side And that's essentially what I do to water them. Obviously, I water them a little bit longer than that, but that's how easy it is to water the soil and not the tomato plants when you have them in this very vertical condition. Tomatoes are one of the more susceptible plants for diseases and specifically for water and borne diseases. So for a lot of our plants, our vegetable plants like kale and collards, you can water them and get them wet and they're not gonna be susceptible to a lot of diseases. But when you water a, a, a tomato plant, 
those water droplets can be spaces for fungal diseases to form. And there are literally dozens of fungal diseases and uh, bacterial diseases that your tomato plants can get. So why, why worry about it? Why put yourself through that stress? So as much as possible, water the soil when it comes to tomatoes. Um, but for other vegetable plants, it's okay if you water them. They're not going to be as susceptible to those fungal diseases, all right? So this is the triple hack. So on the one hand, you basically are helping your tomato plants stay healthy and thriving by keeping them off the soil away from diseases and soil-borne diseases and as well as waterborne diseases. And then you're pro providing more space to grow more food in the bed. And then you're making it so easy to water. Um, and obviously, if you have a drip irrigation system, you can make it even easier. But this is something easy for people who don't have drip irrigation systems and they are watering by hand. All right, tomato hack number six. All right, so this hack is an actual physical tool. Okay, so you've seen how I trellis my tomatoes in order to keep them up off the ground, which means that I do quite a bit of pruning, which means I need a good set of clippers. Now, what makes a good set of clippers? Because there are a lot of clippers on the market. This is my number one go-to tool in the garden, all right? So here are a couple of the reasons why. So one of the things that you're looking for in a set of clippers, the first thing you're looking for is a clean cut. Because if you are cutting your plants and you're crushing your plants, then that is a place where your plants are susceptible to some sort of pest or disease because the plant is experiencing some stress. We want to just clean cut. And so what does a clean cut look like? Well, basically this here is a set of bypass pruners. So basically the blades bypass each other, meaning that you get a clean, swift cut when you cut down. So an anvil, think of it this way. You don't want an anvil set of clippers. Basically it's like in the cartoons where the anvil falls out of the sky and crushes the cartoon character. You don't want the anvil clippers. You want bypass clippers where the blades bypass each other. And scissors work very much the same way. So if you have a set of good scissors, you're, you can use those as well. One of the reasons why I like clippers is that they're heavier duty. So for some of the heavier duty plants like eggplant, uh, it's easier to use clippers than it is to use a good set of scissors. All right. So what makes this gadget so special though? Because this is an extra special tool. This is an extra special set of clippers. The, what I love about this set of clippers is that I'm short and I have small hands. Notice I don't have to move my hands very much in order to use these clippers, which means that I can use these all day long and my hand doesn't get tired. That brings me immense joy in the garden. And that's what I'm after. I'm after lots of homegrown harvest. I'm after a little effort little effort, which brings me much joy. I'm in love with these. I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to make these. What makes these different? There is a little dial on this where basically here is the dial and actually here's the real side, the one. I'm on a one right now. So if I were to squeeze this shut and change this to the outermost setting, now look at this. Holy cow, my hand barely uh, manages to hold that tool and that's a lot of work to do this and a lot of clippers that are on the market are, are one size fits all these are not these are these adjust for your hand size which means that it's going to be easier to use them all right so this is my number one go-to gadget and also safety first so um, I'm gonna you can also go mid-range right like so this is the outermost range you can also go to a mid-range. Let's go to mid-range. And that would be for people who have just sort of regular size hands. Um, so that's easy to cut as well. All right. So the other thing that makes this tool, of course, very uh, awesome is that these are sharp blades. If I were to stick my finger in here, I could cut my finger. And I have done that before. I've been moving really fast in the garden and I've actually cut pieces of skin off of my thumb. So these are really sharp. So the other thing I like about this tool is when you close it, you can basically press this in place and now they're closed so that if you have kids in the garden, this protects your kids from getting hurt. All right, so this is my go-to. I love, this is an, a physical tool. It, the hack is basically this adjustable version of this tool, which makes it so much easier to use, all right? And here it comes, tomato hack number seven. 
All right, so this hack could be considered a little bit of mindset and a little bit of strategy. So the mindset here is to experiment and be open to whatever opportunities that your garden presents. And in this case, we had behind me, this is a volunteer tomato plant, this big bushy one. Uh, a volunteer plant, for those of you unfamiliar with that terminology, is something that just shows up in your garden as a little sprout. It just emerges. And uh, so some, some sort of seed was in our soil, whether it came off of a tomato from last year and that maybe fell down to the ground or a bird ate a tomato and pooped the seed out out, or whether our compost wasn't 100% composted and there was some seeds that were active that grew into this, this lovely bush behind me. So be open to the opportunities that present themselves because here's the deal. Whatever seed this is, if it was from last year's plants, it's possible that the best version is going to grow. The one that's most adapted to my local conditions is going to grow back. That means a healthy, really vibrant plant. And guess what? It's way bigger than any of my other plants uh, with the same exact treatments, all right? The one thing I haven't done to this plant behind me is a lot of pruning because I don't know whether it's a determinate or indeterminate variety because it's a volunteer. So I haven't really pruned it a whole lot. And so the mindset shift is to just be open to the possibilities that your garden might send you some volunteers. Now this tomato plant was not always here. I actually moved it to this location because I didn't like where it came up. So I actually took it and I transplanted it over here. So while your garden may present you with an opportunity, it doesn't. you don't have to keep it exactly in that location. So I moved it over here when it was about this tall and it bounced right back and it grew into this lush version. Now I didn't wasn't sure what kind of tomatoes I would get out of this uh, bush and so uh, lucky for us we've been getting these these uh, largish tomatoes out of this bush so this is pretty incredible so be open to the opportunities but at the same time you have to be a little bit strategically I would say that it in the case of all my tomato plants I'm okay with a couple volunteers but I don't want all volunteer tomato plants because I never know what I'm gonna get I want in my garden, I like to have a little bit of control, and I know I'm working with nature here, so there's some things that are out of my control too. But what I like to do is I like to experiment with like 15% of the garden, and then 85% of the garden I like to do exactly the way that I normally do it, so that that 15% I'm testing new things um, to see if they work better. And then the next year I integrate the things that did work best. So in this case, I really like this volunteer plant, um, but the thing is, is that every volunteer tomato plant is different. We have one volunteer tomato plant right behind it that did nothing. It never grew. Um, it basically failed to produce any tomatoes. So you just never know. So you have to be open to the possibilities. But strategically, you don't want to invest in all volunteer plants because basically anything could happen. You could end up with tomatoes like this or you could end up with, you know, a bush that basically doesn't grow in like the one that was just behind it. So part of this mindset shift is understanding tomato seeds. And there are different types of tomato seeds. There are heirloom tomato seeds, which have been passed down from generation to generation. There are hybrid tomatoes that are basically taking two qualities that we really like out of two different tomatoes and they're hand bred. This is something that nature does all the time. Uh, they cross pollinate them basically and they produce a hybrid which has a a better characteristic, maybe more yield or less susceptible to a disease. Like I have some here that are less susceptible to blight, which is something that we get here on the coast quite often. Um, so you might get a hybrid for those reasons. But then when those seeds, when a hybrid seed drops into the earth, you never know what you're going to get because a hybrid is a mix of two gen genetic of grandparents and if you remember from fifth grade science you might end up with that trait that you really like or you may end up with that not getting that trait or worse getting the worst parts of that plant and not getting the qualities that you want so when you're using a, a volunteer plant you don't know necessarily was it a hybrid was it a heirloom did it come out of your compost unless you are 100% doing exactly all heirlooms all the time and your compost only has heirloom tomatoes in it, 
then you might think that your tomatoes that come up are going to be heirlooms. They might be cross-pollinated though still because that's something that could happen. So with our with the volunteer plants, you just never know what you're going to get. And so it's a crapshoot. So for me, I like to be open to the possibility of uh, working with a volunteer plant, but I also like to, as a strategy to make sure that no more than 15% of my garden is volunteers. And that way the rest of the garden, I know what to expect. And then this is just like a fun little experiment that I get to play with this plant. Are you ready? Tomato hack number eight. So let's talk pruning. When you're growing your tomato plants, Let's face it, most of that foliage, it's just plain fluff because we're after the tomatoes. And there's one important exception, and I'll share that here as well. So you can choose to prune or not to prune your tomatoes, but here's the deal. In my experience, it is way harder to harvest when you have a big tomato bush that's out of control. It's hard to find the tomatoes. They get lost in there. They go bad. And sometimes it's even less yield. And the reason we know that is we do experiments where we prune one and we don't prune another. and We end up with more fruit on the pruned branches. So we've already talked about pruning all the lower leaves of your tomato bushes so that you don't get any soilborne or, or waterborne diseases at the base of the plant, but you don't have to stop there. You can just keep on pruning. And most commercial growers, this is exactly what they do. They grow indeterminate varieties that are vining, and they basically just keep pruning away everything in the bottom uh, up until the where the fruit is forming and then above that is the new foliage that they allow to grow so that that can photosynthesize and they cut everything else below off because it's simply dead weight. We don't want that anymore. It's all old growth. So we cut it off. This significantly reduces disease issues as well. Now, one important thing to remember is those are indeterminate varieties. They can grow infinitely. The more you prune them, you actually increase your harvest because the plant just keeps producing more and more fruit. But when you have a determinate variety, like the one on the left here, it's a smaller bush variety. And so pruning can limit your harvest. So you need to know what to prune off and what to leave. So in a, in a tomato plant, there's a thing called a sucker, and essentially there's a main stem that grows up, and then there's a branch that comes off, a leaf that comes off the side, and then there's a sucker that basically comes out of that that little uh, V shape. And that sucker is essentially like a brand new tomato plant. So in the case of an indeterminate variety that's growing infinitely, you can cut these off because your vine is already going to grow infinitely. But in the case of a determinate variety where you're limited to the amount of growth, you can cut the leaf off, but you can keep the sucker so that you can get continued growth out of your plant and you're not limiting your harvest, all right? So for a determinate, I would say you can cut off as many suckers as you want, and on an indeterminate, I would cut the leaf, but I wouldn't necessarily cut the sucker off. And there are different varieties of trellising. I showed you one option earlier. There's also a string trellis method. And this idea is to prune to two liters, that's what they're called, when you prune it so that there, it becomes like a V at the bottom. And then you train it to grow up that string. And that's all you have. You prune off any of the other suckers. You only allow those two to grow. And you keep removing any leaves that are below the bottom most fruit so that you focus on new growth. And this pruning can help you keep your plants healthier too because whenever you have funny looking leaves, it's either because you have a disease or you have a nutrient deficiency. So if it's a nutrient deficiency, you're going to be checking to see in your soil if there's something that's missing. But if it's a disease, you can just stay ahead of the disease and keep trimming back the diseased leaves off the plant and try to save your tomatoes. And a lot of times, you can get ahead of the disease because the plant can focus on what's healthy, the newer part of the plant, and you can stay ahead of it for as long as your growing season, and then next year you get to try again. So there is one exception to all of this, and that's this idea that our tomatoes are sensitive to the sun, believe it or not. They do love the sun. They, they want lots of sunlight. The plant does, but the tomato itself, if it's on the branch for a long time, it can get sun scald. And this is what it looks like when a tomato gets too much sun. So if you're in an area with a really hot, dry, desert environment and your, your tomatoes are getting a lot of sunshine, you want to keep some of those leaves around because you want to protect from sun scald. All right, so that is the hack. You want to prune and Get rid of all of that fluff, all that foliage, so that you can focus on the tomatoes, which is really what you want to harvest anyway.
Tomato hack number nine. Let's talk about getting the longest growing season possible for your tomatoes. Now, some of us are lucky we can grow year round, but other people, you have maybe 100 days in your growing season and you're trying to get your tomatoes to ripen as soon as possible, take full advantage of the whole growing season before it gets cold again, and I totally get it. So let's talk now about a tool or a do-it-yourself hack that will essentially warm your plants up so that you can get the most out of your growing season, all right? So here's the deal, a lot of tomato plants Plants, they will radically slow down their growth if they get below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what we want to do in the early months when it, the temperatures are still ramping up, we want to get our plants in the ground as soon as possible, right? So that they have as, as long of a runway as possible to mature before the first frost hits. And on the other end of the spectrum towards the winter, we want to protect them from the freeze when those when it starts to get cold as well. So the first step is getting your baby plants out as soon as possible. So as soon, soon as the ground thaws, you can get your tomato plants in the ground. They're sensitive to the cold, but their pollen is more sensitive than the plant is. The plant just grows slowly when it's cold outside, but the, the flowers and the fruiting, those are the things that are affected by the cold and the plant's not there yet. It's still growing roots. So a lot of times a trick that I used to do is I used to put the plant in the ground right when the ground would thaw and then the roots are starting to grow underground and then when the temperatures start to to repeatedly hit 50 degrees Fahrenheit, all of a sudden the top of the plant explodes because the roots underground have grown. All right, so that's a trick that I used. And if you want to add protection, all you need to do is add little mini greenhouses. So it's super simple. You can buy a gadget online and they have these expandable plastic covers online that you can buy and you can just drop right over your tomato plants. And those are great in the fall because you might have really big plants in the fall. So those are really great to buy if you want to book on both ends of your season with those. Um, but if you just want to do it in the spring, then all you need are little plastic bottles that you can put over your tomato plants to create little mini domes, little mini greenhouses to heat them up in the spring so you can maximize the whole season. And if you don't have anything like that, the other thing you can do is, let's say you're growing in a container just for, for kicks. Um, I have here my stake that's holding up one of my plants. You could put two more stakes in here, three pieces, and then I could just wrap the whole thing with bubble wrap or with saran wrap or whatever I had to keep it warm at night. Um, and the plastic is nice that during the day it allows the heat in and it warms up the space. So you can really maximize your growing season with these do-it-yourself gadgets. So the reason this strategy is so important is imagine the difference that you might see in the amount of tomatoes you might get if you could put your tomatoes in the ground four weeks earlier or if you could take them out of the ground four weeks later. Now I'm gonna give you one tip on this. So there, it's pretty easy to come up with some way to protect your uh, tomato plant from the cold. There's lots of do-it-yourself uh, uh, options out there. One tip though, make sure that in this process of adding a little mini greenhouse that you don't accidentally exceed 95 degrees inside of that greenhouse it, because it can happen, trust me. When you put plastic around something and the sun shines down on it, it heats up real quick sometimes, all right? So be careful of that. You might wanna get yourself a little thermometer and, and have it in there just in case. Now here's the pro tip. If you are wrapping your plants with bubble wrap or plastic to keep them warm, one thing you want to be careful of is that you don't want the plastic to touch your plants because the outside air is cold and the plastic, whatever temperature the outside air is, is the temperature the plastic will be. So if the outside air temperatures are going down to freezing and you're trying to protect your plants from freezing temperatures, if that plastic touches your leaves, those leaves will basically end up that same temperature and you don't want that. So if you're wrapping them, you want to make sure that you have your stakes on the outside edges of the bucket and you wrap around the stakes and you make sure no leaves are touching the plastic. That's your pro tip. So this strategy is really important for people with short growing seasons. And if you have a short growing season, the other thing that you wanna think about is a variety with a quick days to maturity so that you can get as many tomatoes as possible within the shortest amount of time. And this strategy is also really great for people like me where we have a temperate climate and it's warm enough almost in the winter to grow your tomatoes and a little greenhouse would just protect them and you would end up with tomatoes all year round. 
And finally, tomato hack number 10. So let's talk about water for a moment here, all right? So this is a strategy hack and also a tool hack. Have you ever bitten into a tomato and thought, meh, that's a pretty watery, blah tasting tomato? That is a tomato that has been overly watered, and that is possible because tomatoes are a plant that are very drought resistant, and so they will tell you when they get too much water. And so you don't want to water your tomatoes too much because your harvest is going to uh, not be as good for a couple reasons. What can happen if you water too much, you get the watery tasting tomatoes, but you can also get cracked tomatoes. Uh, if you get a big rainstorm that's coming your way, you want to go out and pick any fruit that's ripe because it will burst in that in that rainstorm, all right? So rain can do quite a bit of damage to the flavor of your tomatoes and also the quality of your harvest because those tomatoes will rupture. Now, your tomato plants can actually tell you when they're receiving too much water too, which is pretty cool. So pl these plants are drought resistant. Um, when they get to about this height, so this is... Um, about a foot tall. When they get to this height, you really only have to water them once a week and um, you water them well and then you let them completely drain back out again and they will take care of the rest for you. Now, the way that they tell you that they're receiving too much water, take a look at this. On this plant here, if you can see here, we have got yellowing leaves. This, my friend, is a sign of too much water. It kind of looks like it might be a disease or something, but it's not. This is just too much moisture in the in the pot. So basically, I'm gonna snip off a couple more of these because the lower leaves, and it's, it's always on the lower leaves. So all of these are turning yellow. And so oftentimes people think, oh my goodness, my tomato leaves are turning yellow. That must mean they need more moisture, and then they water them more, and the problem gets worse. All right, so you want to know that oftentimes yellowing the leaves means that it's too much water. Now, how do I know that it's too much water for this pot? Well, a couple of clues. In a container, sometimes the drainage doesn't work as well as in your soil. So oftentimes in containers, you'll see lower leaves turning yellow. It's a telltale sign of too much water. Now, I have drill holes in the bottom of this thing. <laughs> Um, but it's not quite enough for the drainage and so I know that I only water this every every week just a little bit of water and it's totally enough moisture and I can tell by picking it up how heavy it is that it's still full of moisture so I know it's it's watered. now you can also use a tool to figure this out all right so you don't have to wait for the plant to tell you it's got too much water there is a moisture meter that you can use and this moisture meter has a red zone, a green zone, and a blue zone. And typically the green zone is where I use a lot of my vegetables. So I would stick this just right in here, about six inches down, and I would read the meter. And wouldn't you know it, this meter right now, I have not watered this in over a week, and it still says that it's in the middle of the green zone. I'm going to wait for it to go all the way down to the red zone before I water it again. So um, so basically one of these can help you diagnose if it's too much water or not, especially if you have these containers, all right? So the strategy hack here is all about getting delicious tomatoes, all right? And for delicious tomatoes, we don't want them to be watery. You want your plants to dry out as much as possible between watering so that they stay healthy and vibrant, that your tomatoes don't accumulate all that extra moisture because they can also crack. And what happens when they crack prematurely on the vine when they're not quite ripe yet then you take them indoors to protect them and sometimes those cracks can form mold and your tomatoes can go bad and I don't want that to happen to you so prevent all of that by underwatering your tomatoes as much as possible and that's going to give you the peak flavor of those tomatoes and if you're not sure how much moisture your plants are getting and whether they're dry or not Use a moisture meter and start to track if you see any yellow leaves, where on the meter are you getting yellow leaves, and then make sure you end up drier than that. All right, there you go. Ten tricks for growing delicious organic tomatoes right at home and more of them, right? Now, if you were to take away just one thing from this video, here's what I want it to be. I want to loop back to mindset hack number one, which is that we're growing tomatoes here. These are not the easiest plants in the world to grow. 
They are 17 times more susceptible to diseases than some of the greens that we grow. But that doesn't mean that they aren't worth growing. It just means we, we have to be patient with ourselves. We need to learn about the plants. We need to understand what they want to thrive, give that to them, find plants that work for our local conditions, and do everything we can to stay ahead of the diseases to keep our plants healthy and thriving. All right, I'm Stacy Murphy from Grow Your Own Vegetables. Peace out.